right, guys. Um, thanks, everyone. So again, thank you, Taylor Conrad, for giving us the educational piece. Uh, thanks, Jillian, for all the great advice. Um, so for mine, it's going to be a little bit fun. It's going to be fast. Hopefully, you'll learn a little bit something. But uh, I think all of this you guys should know already. Um, but so for my senior lecture, I kind of was wondering, oh, well, what do I want to talk about? Um, I thought about, well, what did I do during COVID uh, all this time? What did I, that's a little thing that some people don't know so much about me. And a little thing is, um, I really like zombie movies. I love zombie movies. I watched a lot of zombie movies during COVID. And what I discovered was that there's a lot of different genres within zombie movies. There's fast zombies that are daytime zombies. There's zombies that are like academic zombies. There's zombies with that are like alone and scared at night. There's Korean zombies, there's zombies that are detectives. So I thought, what do I wanna talk about in my senior lecture then? It's gonna be Emily's Guide to Surviving a Zombie Apocalypse. All right, so let's get started. It's June 14th, 2022. You wake up in the morning and you're thinking, okay, let me go through my phone, check my messages. And you see something from Dr. Silkberg. And there's a message that says, Sorry guys, there's a new virus in town and everyone's gone crazy. I've put in my time already with COVID, so Lana and I are taking off on the boat. If you need anything, Don Dukas is in charge. Good luck. <laughs> so you're like, okay, all right, let me scroll through my phone again. Let's see, are there any messages? All right, so then you find one from Don. It says, good morning. There's been an outbreak of a novel virus causing people to become flesh-eating monsters. Please report to Kings County by 7 a.m. tomorrow for debriefing immediately. Stay safe, done. He leaves you with his one piece of advice. Rule number one, and only one. Trust no one. Everyone is trying to kill you or our patients. Okay, so let's get started. All right, so step one, you're gonna find your allies. You go on your WhatsApp, you're looking for everyone, you're checking in, you wanna see where everyone is, right? Group of people are hanging out in Prospect Park early in the morning for God knows reason why. There's the people all around, they're at home, they're around Brooklyn. Turns out Eli and Chris are over at House of Yes. And Lainey's already gone out, she's on a boat on a yacht, she's diving, she's already pieced out, she's gone. And then you wonder where's Ken? Nobody knows where Ken is. <laughs> So then, okay, step two, gather your supplies. So in this situation, this is a magical made up world. You're gonna have Hermione's little bag, magical bag that fits everything in there. You're gonna have any sort of laboratory supplies that you want, any sort of testing, any sort of imaging, CT, MRI, and you're gonna have all the meds in the world that you want. So for this journey, um, as you go through, you're gonna be able to use anything that you want um, to help uh, survive. Step three, you're gonna find transportation. So the group in Prospect Park are looking around and they see, oh, there's a bunch of city bikes. Let's go grab the city bikes. We gotta, we gotta get out. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of zombies roaming around all over the city bikes. So you're running, Paul goes, oh my God, there's a zombie that's, that's hurt. So immediately being Paul, who's very kind, turns around and helps the zombies and immediately gets bitten. So you go, all right, and you're thinking, oh man, this is a human bite, what do I do? So you're like, okay, well, let me get my little grab bag and let's x-ray it, see if there's any teeth. Let's check for fractures, let's irrigate it, give him a tetanus shot, and then we're gonna give him Augmentin or if he's allergic, Clinda and Ciproor, and Ciprobactin. Unfortunately, Paul doesn't make it. So now you're back to, I still need this bike. Now this group of people in includes uh, Monisha, uh, Molly, Trevor, Kenny, and Misho, and Chrissy. So they come up with a plan that say, okay, right, we need these city bikes, but how are we gonna get them? We need someone to distract the zombies. Molly says, no, I can't do that. I can't be the one. I'm a, I'm a cat mom. I have, I have a cat at home, I can't. Kenny says, I can't, I have a dog at home, so I can't do that. Misho says, I have a dog too, but I also have a baby, so kind of, half kind of growing. Trevor says, I have all three, I have a cat, a dog, and a real human baby, so I can't go. 
Nisha says, no, I'm chief. Uh, I, no. So Chrissy gets uh, voluntold, and she's now chief. <laughs> but Mo Monisha uh, feels bad for her, so she goes and uh, helps Chrissy, and Zombie Paul comes up and bites them both. Unfortunately for Monisha, she gets bitten in zone two of a penetrating neck wound. She starts to have a large uh, hemorrhage on the neck. She goes into shock. She loses pulses, uh, has massive hematemesis, and eventually goes into respiratory distress. I'm sorry, Monisha. <laughs> she goes. You, you send her to, to the OR immediately because this is a hard sign of a penetrating neck wound, but can't make it. It's a zombie apocalypse. Chrissy, on the other hand, has a minor wound. She has a little bit of hemorrhage. She has a little bit of subcute air, and she's not talking so great, but it's okay. You decide, okay, let's just watch Chrissy um, and see how she does. Fortunately, throughout the hours, Chrissy starts to get hallucinations. She looks over at Trevor, and then he sees the Muffin Man and asks him, do you know the Muffin Man? And he goes, the Muffin Man? And the Muffin Man. So then Chrissy eats Trevor. Mm, sorry, that's how it goes. All right, so those that everybody gets scared, everyone swoops, everyone runs away. Somewhere down the line, a car comes through, and you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but then Julian comes coming down Flatbush, and Kenny cuts on a bike. They go, they crash into this car. The passenger dies. The driver dies. Kenny gets a Lafort fracture. They're not sure where, but you think, okay, well, let me move this, uh, let's move this hard palate. Hard palate moves, but you also notice that uh, his nose is coming off too. So, all right, you're like, okay, this could be a type two Lafort, but then you notice that his whole face is coming off too. So then you're like, ah, crap, this is a type three Lafort fracture. You're like, can he, can he, can he's not making it. And look at Julian, he's fallen off his bike, he broke his second metatarsal, he is now dislocated, he broke his uh, Lafranc ligament, and now his foot is dislocated and all sorts. He can't run away from the zombies, he also doesn't make it. And now, all right, so those people are there. Now we have Robbie, who, uh, you know, he finds a car but then the car has no batteries. So he finds some wires and then he's trying to jump the car. Unfortunately, he forgets to take his hands off the wires and he jumps the car and he gets electrocuted. And then the bystander runs out, you know, you have your grab bag and the bystander runs the EKG for him and you notice this rhythm and you're thinking, ah, crap. So the bystander defibs him, nothing happens, he's pulseless. Uh, then you give them epi, you keep doing CPR, you do 300 amiodarone, it doesn't work, 150 amiodarone doesn't work, you try uh, lidocaine, doesn't work, and then Robbie goes, because he forgot to take his hands off the patient, or sorry, the car, when I got shot. So let's summarize. Um, we have Robbie who got electrocuted, Trevor got eaten by Chrissy, Monisha had the hard signs of a penetrating neck wound. Paul died of kindness because that's what he does. Whenever you see someone in, in trouble and help, he always goes to help them, but this one kind of bit him. Uh, we think Chris, uh, Vicky, Vicky, that was Vicky's car. So <laughs> that's how she went. And we have Julian who died of the Liz Frank, and Corn Runaway, and Kenny on that bike from the Laporte fractures. All right, so quick reviews. You guys should all know this, but this is just sort of fast paced. All right, so now you're thinking, oh crap, you know, there's a lot of people who pass. Uh, this is really freaking me out. But you're thinking, okay, thank God I froze my eggs before all this happened so that if anything were to happen to me, I'd be able to have other people live on in my progeny. So I'm gonna take this moment to kind of share a little bit of serious wisdom because I didn't know how to fit this in, but this is gonna be where it's gonna be at. Um, I wanted to share just a little bit of wellness for the, um, for, you know, the women and men um, of, of our residency about like IVF, the egg freezing process. 
um, in case, you know, we've sort of delayed our fertility years, our family planning because of residency, it's so long. And for those who are considering it, you know, I just wanted to share a little 101 on what kind of things to think about and how to proceed with it. And so the first one of it is um, really just take a look at your insurance uh, policy. You know, July is coming up and that's the time where you can switch policies. Um, a lot of insurance policies only cover a pre egg freezing if it's considered infertility. And for a lot of insurances, infertility is that one year trying and a lot of them need it to be documented by your OBGYN. Um, before they even consider it. So if this is something that you have in mind, something that you think, okay, well, why not? You might want to start seeing the OBGYN and start to have that discussion. Some might require treatments beforehand um, before you can get started, such as like intrauterine insemination. There's just a lot of these insurance companies have certain tiers that they require out of you before they allow you to do egg freezing or embryo freezing. Um, so those are things to consider. Other things are that um, if you have lifetime maximums, I think the state of New York allows you to have three treatments. Um, some will have a certain dollar amount of how much you can do for IVF or egg freezing. Um, and some will have um, like unlimited, but it really depends on your insurance. And then really considering if it's like primary, secondary insurance, how you want to get it billed. There's different costs associated with the IVF. There's um, costs associated with the drugs. Monitoring is sort of, you know, every morning sort of um, blood work and ultrasounds. Facility fees for retrieval, anesthesiologists, because always they're out of network, and then storage fees. Um, for some, if you want to take a look into it, there's these sort of tailored insurance policies. Um, I've listed a couple of fees, um, which are sort of add-ons, or I know in, uh, like over in California, a lot of the tech businesses, they offer this to their employees now as the like, um, as just like an add on um, benefit for for facility for their employees. So if your regular insurance doesn't cover it, these are sort of add ons uh, to be able to cover IVF. There's a lot in New, uh, New York City, so there's a lot of choices, you know, the little green markers are the ones that you can, you know, just get a look that there's a lot within, and a lot of it is just preference on where to go, you know, recommendations, people you've known before, and if they like the place. So real quickly, um, IVF, I'll just go through the cycle uh, of what the general process is. Um, so when, if you decide to go through it, it's going to be basically in the beginning of your period, you're going to have formal injections. And the idea really is to stimulate the follicles to grow. And then at some point, you're going to do injections to make sure that they don't ovulate. And then once the time is between like 10, 14 days, you're going to trigger have the, the eggs mature, and then you're gonna go to the OR, um, which is like an outpatient procedure to retrieve the eggs. It's an ultrasound guided needle aspiration. If you're doing just egg freezing, that's kind of where it stops. If you're doing embryo, um, they will do the um, sort of the fertilization, wait a couple of days for it to go into the blast stage and then for it to get frozen. So um, that's sort of like a quick kind of uh, overview on like egg freezing IVF, if you guys are interested in it. Um, I know it's such a mysterious process, um, which is I personally was able to go through a couple cycles here while in residency. And so um, if you wanna come talk to me afterwards about the logistics behind being able to do it, um, feel free to come by. But there's no uh, talk um, that wouldn't be without talking about ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So um, this is something that we might see in our ERs um, just as our population changes a little bit and more women are undergoing uh, IVF. And a lot of it just pathophys wise, um, the idea is just your third spacing a lot of the fluid uh, based on all the medications that you're getting. And basically what happens is you have uh, now create a lot of follicles, you have a trigger shot of HCG, you have a massive luteinization which creates overproduction of VEGF. Now you have leaky blood vessels, your third spacing everywhere, you have hypovolemia, edema, you're fluiding everywhere in your body and then organ dysfunction. 
there's different classifications of this from mild, moderate, severe, and critical. And it's just a spectrum of how much fluid you're third spacing because of these leaky blood vessels. Um, the management for it goes from symptomatic management, um, bed rest to sort of if you're got, you have fluid everywhere in your thorax and, you're, and you've got ascites, you have everywhere to, to like physically taking the, the fluid out with paracetesis, thorax and pieces, that kind of stuff. Um, and if you're critical with like organ damage, you go to the ICU. All right, so that's that serious stuff. I'm gonna go back to the fun stuff and let's go back quick. So step four, gather your fur babies. Um, Keith has a cute little dog. She goes and finds them, but then uh, the dog runs away and then it gets into some, uh, some other animals. Unfortunately, Keith's dog turns into a zombie dog and bites her and you're thinking, oh my gosh, what do I do? This does this dog have rabies? You go back to the email that, uh, that Noah and uh, <laughs> Dr. Glazer and Dr. Rathal, all these emails happened. And you're thinking, do I give these, do I give the rabies prophylaxis or not? But then you go back and you're like, this dog looks rapid. So we're gonna do it. So you remember for a rabies prophylaxis and rabies um, treatment, you're gonna do uh, and clean the wound, administer the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the rabies uh, globulin, and then come back for the vaccine in 0, 3, 7, 14 days. 0, 3, 7, 14 days if you've never been vaccinated before. And then if you have, you don't need to give the uh, immune globulin. Great. Now we have Molly. She goes, she picks up her cat, she picks up Remy, beautiful cat, uh, but Remy freaks out when she sees her, scratches her, and then she starts to develop these little lesions. She starts to have some axillary lymphadenopathy. She's not feeling so well. Um, she's like, okay. She gets this lymphadenitis, you give her azithromycin. She starts to develop some hepatosplenic uh, issues. So you give the arimfampin on top of the azithromycin. Then she starts to have eye issues. So you switch, okay, let me just give the arimfampin and doxy for her. And then consider giving some steroids. Unfortunately, she gets the cat stress disease. That's, that's what it is. Um, and she becomes septic and she goes. Meanwhile, uh, Roche uh, is, is seeing uh, Ziba who sees all this, sees a zombie and runs after the zombies and Rose runs after the zombies with, uh, towards Zipa. So, okay. So now Keese is gone with rabies. We have Molly from Cat Scratch and Rose has gone missing. Next, step five. We're gonna find food in the zombie apocalypse. Bing, find some mushrooms. And she says, hey guys, these look really good. Why don't we try this? She takes a couple bites out of it and she says, okay, good. But then she starts to salivate a lot. She starts to, um, starts to drool. She's clutching her stomach. She starts to vomit. She's, her heart is raised. She's really not feeling well. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is a, a poisonous mushroom. So you take a look at it and you're thinking, okay, yeah, okay, just given her symptoms, let's give her some atropine. She starts hallucinating. So let's give her some benzos or water. Then she gets a little better and okay. But then she's confused and she sees these beautiful other mushrooms, these Amanita mushrooms. And she's like, oh, pretty. So she takes a big bite out of it. And then she starts to, she starts to vomit again. She starts getting bloody diarrhea. After a while, you notice that she's starting to turn yellow. Um, and you're like, oh, shoot. Uh, maybe she's going into liver failure. You give her activated charcoal, you give her NAC. You consider giving her high dose penicillin. Um, but unfortunately, she sounds to liver failure. David, David finds some poke and he's like, great, this is delicious. I'm gonna eat this. And then he's like, okay, but now I have itching and hives everywhere and my heart is racing and my stomach hurts a little. So I think I'm gonna go vomit. But now I feel a little difficulty breathing and I feel dizzy. Maybe I'll just lay down for a little bit, but no. You're undergoing anaphylaxis. So you give him the Benadryl, you give him the Pepsid, you give him the steroids. He's not getting better. You give him the EpiPen. He's still not getting better. You start an Epi drip on him. He's still very hypotensive. You give him, you start him on pressors. And unfortunately, he goes with anaphylactic shock. For Stephanie, she, you know, eating is very romantic. He's gray. He's like, 
here. I got you a bunch of flowers. These are beautiful. Unfortunately, they weren't able to find some food. So Stephanie's thinking, all right, there's a lot of edible flowers out there. Let me just take a bite of this. I'm so hungry. So she takes a big bite and then she starts to feel nauseous and dizzy. She vomits and she syncopizes. Butane freaks out, he takes an EKG, he looks at this and he's like, huh, this looks like ditch toxicity. Did he just give Stephanie a whole bunch of foxglove to eat and now she's, uh, she's uh, poisoned? So uh, yes, he did. So you think, okay, well, do I give Dij a bind? She didn't actually take Dij, I'm not actually sure, but if she did take Dij, she would give her the Dij bind. You can consider doing any sort of phenytoin to enhance AV conduction. You can give her lidocaine to decrease the ventricular automaticity. You give her some magnesium and see if that helps. And then you consider treating for any hyperkalemia. That is where she goes to. So now we have Bing who ate the mushrooms. We have David who died of anaphylaxis and Stephanie ate some foxglove, which is the ditch toxicity. And then finally, step six, you find shelter. Chris and Eli are at House of Yes. That's, uh, they just, they find shelter there. Eli, Eli finds a tub of glitter. He's like, okay, the zombies aren't gonna find me here, I'm good. But then he can't hide there forever, so he takes a big whiff. And then he, he's, he's having trouble breathing. And you notice, huh, okay, he probably has aspiration pneumonia. All right, we can treat this, we can treat this. But then he starts to have more respiratory distress. You're like, oh no, this looks like ARDS. But what is that we see? Glitter in his lungs. So he's really not doing well. You decide, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna intubate him. I'm gonna put him on six to eight, um, uh, of, of uh, sorry, of um, idle volume. Um, and then you're gonna start him on a high peep, low FiO2 um, ARDS net protocol for his ARDS. But he doesn't make it, sorry. Chris in the meantime is there. He's uh, all right, he's had enough of this. He gets on stage, he starts, uh, you know, yelling at the, at the zombies and he says something so snarky. It's so offensive that the zombie comes in and he just gives a big slap to Chris. Cause we all know how snarky Chris can be. He's just kind of quiet, but then he can get there and, and give you that um, big comment. He starts to feel really dizzy. He gets a unilateral headache. He has some neck pain. He starts to develop a partial Horner syndrome. He's got some meiosis, got some ptosis. And you're like, oh, Crap, okay. Let me get out my trusty bag. We're gonna do a CTA and you find this. Like, oh no, what is this? But a carotid dissection and you notice, okay, all right, okay. There's gonna be a possible blood clot that's gonna be compressing the blood vessel in the carotid. So, well, let's, let's do some TPA. So you TPA him and unfortunately forget that he's got a bite wound from another zombie somewhere else and he bleeds to death from there. Matt now is trying to find shelter, but Matt forgets to put on his sunblock. And uh, fortunately he starts to turn red. He starts to blister, he starts to peel. And then you realize, okay, he's got a full thickness burn on him. So let's resuscitate him because he's not doing so well. He's got burns on his front, his back, his arms, his head. All of that is equal to 63% for him. So you do the Parkland, uh, Parkland equation, you calculate it out, it comes out to be 17 liters total. You calculate it to be eight liters uh, for the first eight hours. Unfortunately, that's so much fluid for him. You don't have enough fluid. He can't get resuscitated and he dehydrates. So those two are out as well. And now it's 6.50, it's June 15th. We finally made it. Kings County. All right. Walking down the street, you're almost there. You come across uh, these two skeletons. You wonder, huh, who is this? What happened? Take a closer look. I'm like, okay, I wonder who this could be. Take another look. I'm like, ah, crap. Mishu and, uh, Mishu and Sufa must not have been able to find food when they were asked to find food. So they starve to death on the way. So you make it to, you make it to Kings County. 
And lo and behold, we find Mark. He's already poured. He's already making cups uh, at Cup Tower because Mark already got there at 6.30 because that's what he does. He gets there on time, not even on time. He gets there early. Um, and that's how he survives the zombie apocalypse. In rolls in to Mama's Needy and Roche. Needy found Roche running down the street looking for Ziba and saves her, brings her to Kings County. Alex comes running in with her big, I don't know what that is, burrito. <laughs> she's, uh, she's fine. She's able to make it. And then lo and behold, you find someone else, none other than Vicky, because in that Porsche was not Vicky, but other than her doppelganger, Chris Lim, she actually made it. And so we have Mark, who's always there early. We have our four mothers, who of course made it because other than surviving residency, they're a freaking human during residency. Of course, they're gonna survive. <laughs> Sorry, Trevor, you didn't grow the baby. It doesn't count. Um, and that's it. So that is Emily's Guide to Surviving a Zombie Apocalypse. Um, it's been really fun. I love you guys. It's been a really great ride. Um, you know, we've been there through thick and thin, had a lot of fun. I now realize we left a lot of glitter in Monisha's apartment because glitter doesn't come out. Um, yeah, you guys have been there for my wedding. For the juniors who didn't know, they threw me a COVID wedding and Paul married us. Um, and then we just been having a lot of fun. So thank you guys. Thank you to all my attendings who have taught me so much over, over the years. I'm um, really gonna miss you guys. Thank you and my cat. That's it.